but if you really wanted to pick some of the species that I guess are more disposable, the first species that, come in, that comes into my head is Dendrobates uh, auratus, mm. which is usually, they usually market it as the green and black. I hate the common color names. I think they're ridiculous, but uh, <laughs> Dendrobates auratus, either the, I think it's the, the Costa Rican locale, and believe it or not, they're actually, they've been introduced into Hawaii. So there's oh, also, wow. yeah, there's a, there's a Hawaiian population there. But um, they're, they breed very easily and um, they're cheap. You can buy them for maybe 30 bucks a frog, if not cheaper at an expo. There's a whole slew of species of, within that genus, but there's a species called imitator. And imitator mimics, um, they basically mimic the locales of other species that live in that area. Wow. Meta- instead of sequestering and metabolizing those toxins from their diet, they're using that to reproduce and create more offspring. So it's an energy saving wow. way for one species of dart frog to mimic another. And they, they <laughs> welcome to episode number 102 of the Animals at Home podcast. My name is Dylan Perrin. Thank you so much for tuning in today. Now, first off, I want to apologize if this episode is late. It may or may not be late. So you might be listening to it on schedule or it may be late. The reason I don't know if it's going to be late or not is because as you can see, if you're watching on YouTube, you'll see that I have moved into my new location, still setting things up. It was a really crazy wild week. One of the things that's not set up as I'm recording this is the internet. The guy was here earlier today and now I'm waiting for their system to refresh for the internet to come up. So hopefully this episode is up on time. And if it's not, I apologize for that. It'll be up as soon as I have internet to upload the file up to YouTube or any of the podcasting platforms. So anyway, we'll get through and I'll talk more about my new space on YouTube and whatnot. If you're listening on the podcast, you can go to YouTube to see the new space, but I will do a tour at some point in the future. But anyway, more important than that is introducing today's guest. So today I'm speaking with Dan from the podcast and Phibicast. Now, if you're not familiar with AmphibiCast, it's one of, if not the only amphibian-based podcast out there. Dan actually had me on his show a few months back. I want to say three or four months back. We talked about advancing husbandry and whatnot. It was a great time, and I thought it would be awesome to have him on this show as well. So in the episode, we discuss the importance of keeping animals on the mental health side. It's something we've covered on the podcast a couple of times in the past, but it's been a while since we've talked about it, and I think it's just so important to really highlight the importance or, or the positive, the the positive aspect of keeping for the keeper themselves. So we discuss that. We also discuss his podcast, why he started AmphibiCast, and and the challenges he's had with it, and the successes he's had with it. We discuss the concept of disposable species or garbage species, and that obviously sounds like an incredibly aggressive way to put something, and we don't actually mean animals that should be thrown out or animals that we don't want to respect their life. But we discuss is that concept and how it kind of percolates into herpetoculture. There are species on both the dart frog side as well as the reptile side that become, as they become very popular, people no longer want to keep them and it decreases their interest and decreases their value. And then we start to treat them, unfortunately, as disposable animals in some cases. So we discussed that concept. We also discussed dart frog localities, which is a whole other conversation, really blew my mind. And we discussed what it takes to get into dart frog keeping. And and if you want to become a dart frog keeper, what are some steps you should take to make sure you have success? I know you will enjoy the episode, but before we hit play, let's do our housekeeping really quick. If you are interested in learning more information about this podcast episode or any other, make sure you head to animalsathomenetwork.com. You can also find links to the shop at animalsathome.ca slash shop. If you want me to pick yourself up a t-shirt or a sweater, $5 does automatically get donated to the Amazon Rainforest Conservancy if you do that. And if you would like to join us on Patreon, you could head to patreon.com slash animalsathome, and there you'll have early access to episodes 
not this week, but most weeks you'll have early ap- early access to episodes as well as the opportunity to submit questions to upcoming guests. And thank you very much to CustomReptileHabitats.com for sponsoring this episode of the podcast. If you're looking for any reptile-related equipment, make sure you check out the affiliate link in the YouTube description or the show notes. And one final quick thing before we jump into the episode, I was on a podcast or I, I recorded a podcast with Dr. Chris Jenkins from Snake Talk a couple of months back. I want to say two months back and it is now officially released. So you can head out to Snake Talk, just search, search them on Google. I'll make sure the, their link is in the show notes as well and you can listen to that conversation. It was a fantastic conversation and I hope you have time to check it out as well. Enjoy this episode. Dan, welcome to the podcast. Thank you for doing this. What's going on, Dylan? Uh, What am I saying? Welcome. Thank you for having me. See, this is what happens when you're so used to hosting a podcast, you fall back into the host role immediately. I know. It's kind of the default setting. I'm so so unused to it, you know? Yeah, yeah. (laughs) I did that the other day. I forget who I was, what podcast I recorded, but I got through the whole thing. And at the end, as I was going to the outro, I, I was like, to, to close at the podcast, I welcomed the guest to the show. Like, it's like your your brain just goes on to, vote, to you know, auto drive. And I'm just like, welcome to the podcast. And it literally was like an hour and a half into the show. It was kind of, it was just funny. It's funny how we build up those habits. But anyway, I love to have you on the show. Happy to have you here. And I think you are, have you had... I know that you had posted something on Instagram the other day saying you were at episode 50, but maybe you're at episode number 51 of the podcast. Is that right? Yes. At this point, that we're, as we're recording, I just recorded 51 last night with uh, Troy Goldberg, who I've had on in the past. I think Troy was episode five. So we did a pretty long recording session last night, and I'd kind of taken some time off between episodes. Um, my epi- episode 50, I had Zach Heron. He's on uh, Instagram as um, uh, I am making art, and he, he was a great guest for number 50 and then kind of Troy was like starting off the new uh the new season 51 yeah yeah well congrats on that 50 is no small feat that's a that's a lot of episodes to record Thank we'll you. get into the to the podcast a lot later because I have lots of questions around that and, sure and for those that haven't listened to it I'll encourage them to go check it out but so we'll, we'll get there but before we do that let me know how, how did you get into keeping frogs so what was the the first experience there um that's a long story I'm trying to think of the best place to begin that. I I, I guess the, the, the first encounter that I actually had with a wild frog, which was, they were American toads in my, my grandparents' backyard. Um, they moved out here from Long Island, from Queens in like the, I guess it would have been the 40s. And at the time it was still very rural out here. And then as, you know, we grew up in the area, more, you know, suburbia, the suburban sprawl kind of began. And um, you started finding less and less wildlife, especially amphibians. And I remember going into their backyard and they had like window wells and we used to find a toad there like every spring and we would, we would pick the toad up. We would put it in, they had this like, um, they used to get milk delivered to the house. This is how long ago this was. They used to get milk (laughs) delivered to the house and they had this little insulated steel box. So we would take the toad, we would put it in the box and we would just kind of study it, you know, check it out for a couple hours. And then before we left to go home, we would let it go. And every year we saw it. So that was really the first experience that I had with any kind of amphibian. As far as keeping, though, I want to say I began around 10 years old. There was a a local shop one town over. And um, when we would go down there shopping, I would, you know, my my mother would go shopping. I would go in and just check out the animals. And they had some pretty wild stuff back then. This was like 89 or so. I mean, they had hedgehogs in 1989, just to give you how like how wild this place was. But they had axolotls on display. And in retrospect, they were probably the most unhealthy axolotls that I had ever seen. They were like, by today's standards, they were, you know, emaciated. They, they didn't thrive. They didn't do too well. But, you know, my house was not a very herp-friendly house. So the axolotls were a good beginner species for me. Unfortunately, they didn't do too well because at the time, there really wasn't the understanding to the average person in terms of how to maintain them successfully. But those were the first amphibians that I ever had back then. And then I had quite a few species over the years. I had a kind of took a break from amphibians for a while. got more into reptiles. I would kind of go through phases. I started actively keeping more once I got into high school and I actually had built my own little reptile room. I had a walk-in closet. So I had the only room in the house that had a walk-in closet. So I, I filled it with tanks and, and lighting and stuff like that. And um, I, 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 had a, I had a Colombian tegu. I had 
A um, couple other things. That was about the time where I got my first decently healthy axolotl. And um, I kept horned frogs. I kept, um, really when I was young, we, uh, I kept a lot of salamanders too. I kept a lot of eastern newts, um, a lot of weird crazy stuff that I couldn't even tell you the common or scientific name anymore because the salamander trade in the U.S. took a serious dive. There's, there's been... Um, the salamander equivalent of Kitrid that is in Europe, they're trying to keep that from coming here to the U.S. So the legislation basically listed, I think it was like 201 species of salamanders as injurious. So a lot of the salamander species and new species that we took for granted all those years ago that I had when I was a kid are very, very difficult to find. There are people who captive breed them and whatnot, but it's not like, you know, like the old days when I kept Eastern newts and things like that. But that was really the the, the earliest was, um, you know, was, was caudates. I really didn't start keeping frogs until really much, much, much more later, probably around like the late 90s and the early 2000s. I actually... 1995, I bought an adult male pixie uh, out of some guy's car for 25 but <laughs> for 25 bucks. It's a classic like herpetoculture story. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And it was it was funny because I worked at a local store at the time, and the guy showed up to buy crickets or something like that, and he said, "Oh, he goes, I have a, I have a pixie. Do you want to buy it?" And I was like, "Yeah." <laughs> so that was right around the time that I got into it, and then I kind of took a break for a while. Once uh, the early 2000s started, I, I, I had a pair of I had a pair of white tree frogs for a long time, and I kept them on and off for a while. And um, did I say this was going to be a long story? <laughs> yeah, you, you you prepped us for it, but I, I like these long stories. Yeah, and then um, around the early 2000s, I I ended up in, in some different uh, living situation, we'll say, and I basically had. <laughs> I had the clothes on my back. I had a two-gallon tank with my two dumpies, and I had a cap, a wild caught go, uh, golden gecko, and that was basically all that I had. Uh, <laughs> and then uh, I kind of restarted my life life over with really not too much. Um, I had those three individuals for a long time after the fact. I had them for probably a good ten years after that, but. Um, then I, you know, as I got married and I started a family, I backed off from the hobby a bit. I, I always kept animals, but I didn't keep them to the extent and with the same interest that I do nowadays, which really started back again around 2016. Mm-hmm. So from then on, it was my, my approach changed. It was really less about having animals just to have them and really more about having animals with a, uh, I guess with a greater appreciation for what they are and, and you know, uh, their care and really advance. I, I took it more serious as a hobby, I should say. Yeah. That's, the, that's the best way to put it. I'll, yeah, I want to dig into that a little bit. So maybe right before we do that, can you give everybody just a little outline of what you have now? Like, what are you keeping? Yes, I'm in my frog room now, which I don't normally record in because there's a lot of... Everyone's actually being quiet right now. But um, if I'm just going to kind of circle around, I've got... Um, frog wise, I have this, the two tanks behind me, which I don't know if you guys, I mean, on the YouTube video, you guys are probably able to see it, but, um, I've got one Dendrobates tinctorius Patricia here. Uh, that's a female. There's a group of about four Epipetobates anthonii. They also go by the name of the phantasmal dart frog. Uh, I've got an empty tank over there. I've got two Theliodermic corticale, which are the uh, Vietnamese mossy frogs. I've got, um, the parents and siblings of these frogs, another tank of Epipetobates, because those things breed like like crazy. They're like the guinea pigs uh, or like the rabbits of the frog world. Uh, I've got uh, two Dendrobates tinctorius azurius. I've got another uh, Dendrobates tinctorius patricia. I've got two Phyllobates bicolors, uh, two Phyllobates terribilis. Uh, I've got a couple of other odds and ends on the other side of the room. I've got a uh, tinctorius oyapak. I have a Phyllobates bicolor uh, Uraba. That's the Uraba locale. I have two Phyllobates bicolor froglets because I'm working on developing a breeding project with them mm. later on. That's something in the works. I have another uh, another Patricia, and I've got a Ceratophrus orita, the Brazilian horn frog. I've got a female pixie over there. Uh, I've got a white tree frog. And um, 
and then just like some other little odds and ends. Like I've I've got the the spiders, and I've got um I've I've got th- I've only got three snakes now. I was never a big snake guy, but I have my uh, California king snake, which I've had for nineteen years. Wow. Yeah, wow. I've, I've had him. Yeah, I've had him for nineteen years, and I've got a pair of uh, not a breeding pair, but I just happen to have a male and a female um, blood pythons. Which are um, I'm not a big morph fan, but they're they're T negative albino, which is, to me is just they're white, but uh, or not white, they're white and red. But yeah, yeah. Uh, I like those too. And snake snake wise, if I could only keep one species, I would just keep the blood pythons and, and nothing else. But so you have a, a pretty diverse collection, especially on the frog side. You got quite a lot going on there. I do, I do. Uh, I have a lot of repeats, but I I don't have a, the large variety of species that some keepers have, but I have quite a few I, somehow i ended up with like quite a few of what i already do have so <laughs> so then know. as you went through that that you know th- that sort of transition obviously you kind of got out of the hobby for a while and then when you came back into it you're saying like in 2016 is when you started to sort of change your mindset about keeping was there something specific that that made you have a shift as far as you know digging into the keeping on a more serious note or well yes what happened was i made some very, very significant lifestyle changes. And the direction that my life was going in at the time was not a very healthy one for a, a number of reasons, which I, you know, that's, I'm, you know, pretty private about that stuff. But once I decided that it was going to be important to change my life in a positive direction, going back to the hobby seemed like a reasonable um you know, it seemed like a reasonable solution to a, to a problem. And I thought, I told myself for, for years and years, I mean, I also, I had, I had a job for about 15 years, which was very, very taxing, which was, was part of the reasons I, I was only, I was only off a few days a year. I very seldom was able to see my family. I was very seldom able to engage in any kind of hobbies because I was constantly working. You know, I was working when I started this job, I was working probably 60, 80 hours a week. Wow. With, with, and it went on and on and on like that. But when I finally had time, I said to myself, look, you know, you've, you've missed out on this for a long time. This is something that you really wanted to get serious about. Now that you're at this point in your life where you really want to go in a different direction, take the hobby seriously, put all your energy into it, just go full force and do the things that you always wanted to do. And by building better quality enclosures and by really picking a species or not a species, I should say a group of species that was a little bit more challenging. That was a way of me giving myself something productive to do. So as I got out of those bad habits and things like that, out of those, you know, d- difficult parts of my life, part of which was a job, part of it was other stuff. It was, it was something to do. It was a way to refocus. It was a way to say to myself, you know what, I want to turn my life around in a positive way. And this is a good, this is a good thing, you know? And, um, you know, it's it's continued to be so. I guess you know what's a good analogy. I think it's uh, many of us struggle with control. We we are, we get stressed out and upset by things that we can't control. We can't control life. We can't control the stresses, the events that happen, and it's 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 difficult on us. And this is one of those things that I guess I could I can control. Mm-hmm. You know, I can I can determine the captive well being and the proliferation of my, my plants my animals i can give them the best life that i possibly can and for me it's rewarding it's like gardening for some people or like fixing up cars you guys say i'm just pleased with the result yeah and you know it's, it's such an important point to make about herpetoculture that 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 message is something that a lot of people have an experience with as well so now i want to talk about that in a second but before that so when you when you decided okay i want i'm going to put my my energy here. I'm going to be serious about it, and this is going to be a tool for me to to you know move my life into a more positive direction. How did you start? Did you did you did you already have a species in mind or a group of species that you wanted to grab? Like you said, you were kind of going to narrow it down to a few things. Did you just go buy a new enclosure and start setting some things up? Like, what was the step by step process there? Well, what we did was um, we had also moved. I. I Bought my first house. I mean, my wife and I lived in an apartment for a, a few years early on in a marriage. And um, I mean, I'm, I'm, we got married in 2005, so we're married like a long time. And we lived in a few different places. But we, our first house in 2007, um, we lived there for about nine years. And then we moved to our new house in 2016, 
which was actually the house that we had lived in beforehand. But there was more space here. So I had an area that I could dedicate to my collection. And I just kind of started building. I started thinking to myself, you know, you've seen these exhibits at these zoos and things like that. You've seen these these really elaborate enclosures that you want to model. And I have the space for it, so do it. So I started with... Um, so, you know, obviously, I brought over some of the some of the animals that we had. I, I mean, like my California king snake, I've had for for forever, like almost two decades. Obviously, he came. Um, a couple of other odds and ends came. My tur- I've had my tur- my radar slider for um, probably about the same amount of time, probably about eighteen years. Uh, we we bought her from that. Remember that I told you about that store that was back when I was a kid. Yeah, we we got her there actually. Um, in, the, in a snowstorm, for some reason, it possessed us to go out and buy a turtle in a snowstorm, but we've had her. <laughs> and everything else I just sort of built. Like, I, I uh, here in the US is a big box store and they have a dollar per gallon sale. And I went there with my daughter and we bought four 40 breeders, which barely fit in the car. And I custom, I mean, I, I if the lights are starting to go off and I can't really show it, but I basically built a massive wooden kind of like, um, enclosure type of deal and i put the four the 440 breeders in it the idea was that it would my original idea was that it would look like one gigantic tank that was just separated by four bars along the middle it didn't quite come out that way but it, to me visually it's impressive and it was a goal that i wanted to accomplish so it sort of started there and then i started adding in uh, some of the exoterras for some of the other species that weren't really weren't conducive with that because when i did that build there were things i didn't like like if you're if you're getting dart frogs, just don't. If you're if it's going to be a large enclosure, don't use a forty breeder because it's it's a pain trying to reach over the top and everything like that. But um, yeah, I did that, and then I just slowly started building my collection up again. I started off with I, I had kept dart frogs in the past. I, I had kept or- Oratus, um, but with not a lot of success. And again, this was going back in the early two thousands. But I started off with uh, four Azurius. And two bicolor, and the bicolor I still have, and um, I also got a uh, I got a, ended up with a male Patricia and a I'm not quite sure of the sex on this one, but my Oyapak, um, that was the other one. My Oyapak is my oldest dart frog that I've had now. So since 2016, that's what is that about six six years or so, or yeah, almost six years, and that's how it started, and it just sort of evolved from there. I started building enclosures and letting them grow in and then adding frogs and slowly it just it just escalated and then my new thing now is i've been becoming a little bit more of a plant snob so i you've been talking to troy too much yeah 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 so i started i started getting to aroids i bought my first aroid uh like a couple of months ago and i i had that just sitting in an unplanted vivarium but um you know, I, I did. I started doing some builds and whatnot. I mean, I've still some of these vivariums are still going now. But um, I look at them and I think to myself, "What the hell was I thinking back then?" Because I'm so dissatisfied with the way they came out. But, yeah, that's how it always goes. Yeah, you gotta you gotta keep building enclosures and putting vivs together to to get better at it. You correct. never, you know, you put the you put it together and you're like, "Wow, this is amazing. This looks like a jungle." And then, yeah, a year later, you're like, "I would never have put that plant there today. That plant is in a stupid position." But yeah, I I think. That, that process of diverting, I could say like negative lifestyle to something positive is something that I talk about on the podcast quite often because it's something that I think many keepers don't talk about enough. And I think many of us use the hobby or use herpetoculture for that reason. And I think we should all talk about it more because of how beneficial it is to be, to like you said, like you even use the word goal, like you set, you, you set a goal and you went after it. And the the having something in your life where you can push energy towards that's going to be positive and keep your focus is so crucial. And it, it, it can be the difference between your life going down one super negative path and then, or a positive path. That's very true. And I, uh, I'm not really particularly active on online, like social media and stuff like that. I'm, I don't really like people very much and I'm on the whole, a pretty private person. But I am active on on a, one of the um, tarantula forums because I'm also a, a, you know really into tarantulas. And the funny thing is, I got into tarantulas after being an arachnophobe for years, and I got into tarantulas as a way to d- distract myself from the frogs because the, <laughs> I was obsessing about the frogs so much. I wanted I needed a hobby from the hobby, so that's how that <laughs> happened. But 
I was on one of the, the message boards and I was, you know, a guy posted a thread and he said, look, um, you know, he goes, look, I, I just got clean. I was an addict and uh, now I'm spending, you know, money on, on spiders. And, you know, he's like, is that okay? And I said, to, I said, look, man, like if going out and buying tarantulas and taking care of them is giving your life meaning and purpose, that's a good thing. You know, that's, that's, you, you can't hurt people doing that. You know, when you're messing around with things that you shouldn't, unhealthy lives, you know, I mean, look, people are human. Everyone has life struggles. You know, anyone who's, anyone who says that they live a straight life with nothing else is, you know, is not, not being completely honest with you. And, you know, it was nice to see that this guy, I mean, obviously assuming everything was, was legit, it was nice to see that this guy was able to kind of find the same substance and the same meaning in a hobby that I had, you know? So that's, it's, uh, I mean, again, it, it was a way for me to, I mean, honestly, I don't even think of myself really more as like a herpetoculturist. I think of myself more like a gardener, Yeah, you know, I, I, I take these things and I make them live, you know, you, you, you plant the figurative seeds or the literal seeds with the plants and you let it grow and you, you nurture it and you tender it, uh, you, you, you nurture it, you tend to it. And then you, you enjoy the, the end product. So I don't know. It's just it to me. It just seemed like a healthy mindset, and for this guy, it seemed to be something that he needed too. So I encouraged yeah. him to do it. And a lot of people on the forum also did. They a lot of people, you know, said that. Look, I've been through the same thing, and, and a lot of people have. So I mean, in, in your experience, like, have you had conversations with people like that? Oh yeah. I, I mean, I've had whether it's you know a drug issue or you know depression or anxiety or there there are so many different things that make life difficult and challenging. And I think part of what being a human is is interacting with something physically in front of you and creating things i think creativity is a huge part of of where mental wellness comes from so whether or not creativity comes through you know drawing or painting or working on a car like you said it could be a, there's a, so many different ways to to be creative but i think as humans we absolutely need to express creativity in some way and if you're somebody who isn't I'm not saying all mental health issues come from not being able to express creativity, but I think a lot of them could be attributed to that. And yeah, I've talked to so many people who use the hobby as an outlet for that and their life is better for it. And there's just no other way to say it. That's very true. And if, look, I would rather stress about a plant not growing than so many other things like that. So if, if you, you, we're all going to create stresses for ourselves. So if I'm creating a situation where I'm worried about my plants and something like that, you know, I'm not worried about doing something else that I shouldn't be doing or, or something that's not going to be, you know, healthy or stuff like that. I mean, it, it keeps you, it keeps you out of trouble is mm -hmm. really what it does is it, it keeps you out of trouble. You know, I mean, as long as you do it right, you're not doing <laughs> illegal stuff in the hobby, but <laughs> yeah, yeah, it, yeah it, there it are ways to do legal stuff in the hobby too. Yeah, but. yeah, yeah, yeah. But I like to, I don't, I don't like to mess around with any of that stuff either, but it's it's just I, I I honestly I don't even think about it so much. I just sort of do it, you know. I, I come yeah. home from work, I I you know I see my family, and I come downstairs and I stare at my frogs for a while, and <laughs> yeah, exactly. I, I prune plants. It's it's rela it's relaxing, you know. It's yeah. like um like Mr. Miyagi, you know. Mr. Ya Mr. Miyagi had all those hobbies. Um, for those of you that remember the Karate Kid, but how can yeah. you not how can you not remember the Karate Got Kid? Another Karate but, Kid. Um, but. It's about finding peace and balance. That's all it is. You know, look, I'm no one special. I'm just a regular guy. I just happened to find a hobby that suited me, gave me a sense of purpose, a sense of direction, and really something to look forward to each day. Obviously, in addition to my, you know, my family and all that stuff is more important than this, but, you know, everyone needs something to do. And for me, this was just a good fit. It, it combined things that I enjoyed when I was a child and things that I enjoyed as an adult. So it just made, it just made sense. For me, it was a perfect fit. Yes. Yeah. And I think the other thing it does is it forces you to be present and in the moment, which is for me, like when I go through sort of anxious spells, which happens to me more often than not with this last year of just, you know, craziness, it's because I spend time dwelling on things that I either I'm going to have to do, or I get stuck in these, like, you know, creating crazy amounts of lists and, you know, doing all these things. I'm just looking at my list over and over and over again. Where as soon as you start working with your animals, you are there in the moment and you're, you're moving the animal from what is it's, well, the snakes, you know, taking them out to clean their enclosures and, and, you know, something is, 
even gross as cleaning enclosures can be very peaceful. It's like very calming and you're there in that moment. And whether it's just like the 15, 20 minutes a day that you're spending there, it just helps you relax, like you said, and it helps you start... we, we are humans are terrible for not staying present and I think that's you know you're referencing Karate Kid with Mr. Miyagi that's what all those you know the bonsai tree all these things are to remain present in the moment and the hobby just gets you there immediately when you're working with the animals yeah it's almost like a um, I guess you could say sort of I don't mean a pointless activity I don't mean pointless in the extent that like an animal's life is pointless or your life is pointless but it's not an essential thing to do in life. It's not mm-hmm. giving you food. It's not giving you shelter. It's not It's not doing any of those ends. It's It's just a pointless activity, but it, it's more enjoyable to you than all the things that you need to do to stay alive. So, <laughs> yeah, you know, it's, it's, it's something to do, you know, and, um, I find it, I find it rewarding, you know, I mean, other, you know, my wife and my kids, they have hobbies that they find rewarding. They're good at. This is just, this is just for me. Yeah. It's just, oh, it's just always, it's always been there in my life. I've always loved exotic weird animals like frogs and bugs and stuff like that so now i'm an adult i can do what i want so i i do yeah exactly yeah no i think it's it's a good conversation to have and for anyone listening i hope that i I hope people start talking about that more because i think some people don't even realize why they're involved in 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 the hobby they're just kind of doing it they don't realize how much joy they're getting out of it and i think if we promote that message more across the board outsiders would have a better understanding of why we do it you know like i always say i'm never mystified why somebody has a hobby because it's every hobby you kind of do it for the same reason it's just you got to find you know head towards the direction of the thing that you're interested in but anyway we'll move on from that because i I think uh we kind of touched those spots um I, i wanted to chat about something that we actually chatted on your podcast when i was on your show as well sure was the sort of this idea or concept of cheap or throwaway pets and or th- it's throwaway species, I guess we'll say, because we see it in re- the reptile world quite often. It's the, the animals that are very popular and they become the very cheap pets at pet stores and they become that sort of revolving door. And I know there are some in, in the dart frog community as well. So what, what are some of those species that you would consider as like, you know, we don't like to use the term throwaway, but they kind of become that. Believe it or not, it, it varies. It's sort of a cyclical thing. And, mm-hmm. I I remember when I was a kid, one of the first locales, well, we'll get into locales and morphs because I know that that was something else that you wanted to mm-hmm. make a distinction between, but um, the first, well, there were one of the first species that came into the trade in the early 90s was Dendrobates tinctorius, and the locale was known as Patricia, which is the locales that I have now. I have quite a few of those. And they were really common for a while. They were most people's first experience with dart frogs were with that species or with a few others and then they kind of fell out of favor i don't want to say they became a garbage species but they kind of fell out of favor and they sort of disappeared they're still for sale but people don't buy them with the same enthusiasm but if you really wanted to pick some of the species that i guess are more disposable the first species that comes that comes into my head is dendrobates uh, erratus Mm-hmm. Which is usually they usually market it as the green and black. I hate the common color names. I think they're ridiculous. But <laughs> uh, Dendrobates erratus, either the I think it's the the Costa Rican locale, and believe it or not, they're actually they've been introduced into Hawaii. So there's oh, also wow. yeah, there's a, there's a Hawaiian population there, but um, they're they breed very easily, and um, they're cheap. You can buy them for maybe thirty bucks a frog, if not cheaper at an expo. So. The serious froggers don't really involve. I mean, I, I, I mean, we don't really involve ourselves with those. Although I, I did have a, tr- I did have a tree of them relatively recently, but it's not. Um, the, the difference, I guess, between being like a real serious hobbyist and keeping the more challenging and expensive and difficult species because there's more work involved. But the more common species like that, like like um, Aratus and. Really, a lot of the Dendrobates look uh, the um, Dendrobates tinctorius locales like um, Azurius. I mean, which is a beautiful frog. If you've ever seen Azurius, it's it's th- this beautiful blue frog that's bold and it's just it's it, it's great. I have two of them, but they're cheap. You know what I mean? So people can sell them and buy them as as I don't want to say disposable pets, but uh, look, uh, I see them for sale at big box stores and. It, it it burns me up because I feel like that's not the type of place to really get your approach into into dark frogs. I, I don't think that that's really your, your best place to get involved with any animal for that matter. But 
Um, it's very easy for people to buy these things and not take proper care of them. And if they die, oh, well, then I get another I get another group at the next expo. Whereas like with some of the Ophaga species, uh, I mean, those frogs, they can they can fetch a lot of money. The, some of the Ophaga species, especially some of the rarer, rarer locales or like some of the large obligates like Histrionica or Lamani, you don't get large numbers of, of, of tadpoles out of them. So how expensive would one of those be? D- depends, you know, um, for a f- froglet, 1200 bucks, 1500 bucks. Oh wow. For a and sex- Aratus would be like 50 bucks or 30 bucks. Like you said, you could probably buy it. If you had a proven pair of Aratus, you could probably buy them for maybe 200 bucks. Yeah. For a proven wow. pair of Aratus. Whereas like a proven pair of, uh, um, I've seen, I've seen frogs for sale for about four grand. Wow. For for adults of certain yeah of certain of like Ufaga species, but I don't I don't have anything like that presently. I just I don't have four thousand dollars to spend on a frog. But uh, I know I know people who work with them and they put a lot of effort into them. They don't breed as quickly as some of the other. Um, I mean, just so uh, just to just to clarify, actually, I should I should mention this because this is kind of part of the equation. The Ufaga genus. They're obligate egg eaters, which means that the tadpoles can only eat unfertilized eggs that the mother frog lays. Whereas with Dendrobates, Tinctorius, Aratus, uh, Leucomelus, etc., those tadpoles can be raised by the average person with just relatively minimal care, and then with a a diet of depending on what you're feeding. I mean, I don't. I have my own preferences, and some people have theirs, but. Um, use a combination of algae, dried insect, uh, some sort of protein source, um, fish, depending on, people say quality fish flakes. I never had really good luck with that, but I kind of have my own recipe and most people do as well. Uh, some of the Rapashi products work pretty well, but the point is the obligate species, the parent, the parents raise them. So they, you know, they get deposited usually in a bromeliad cup or a film canister. We, we use film canisters in the vivariums to encourage the dart frogs to lay their eggs in there and then the female will lay unfertilized eggs and the tadpoles eat those so the problem is you can't recreate that and people have tried so that also is a function of why those frogs are more expensive is because you can't cheat the system you know if if the parents are not productive or something's missing in that environment you're not going to get the the fecundity that you would get with other species so like tinctorius will breed pretty much pretty much constantly so they're a good, you know, species that, that are disposable are generally easy to care for. They're hardy and they breed with with minimal uh, intervention on our parts. So that's why those frogs are, are cheap. That's, those are the ones that you see at expos. You know, if, you, if you're looking for a really large obligate species, you're going to be on a waiting list possibly for months. Like some of the breeders that I know, they have people waiting for a certain locale or something like that. They could be waiting a year or two years. Especially wow. since since COVID happened, there's been a, a rise in the demand because obviously people are sitting at home and they're thinking about what they want to add to their collection or the, what they want to start. And um, yeah, those frogs can fetch, they can fetch a high price. You know, I mean, you, you think that some of the the um, different like ball python morphs are expensive. It, it That carries over into the frog world. But it's it's not a question of rarity. It's just a question of how difficult it is to recreate more of them. Right. And and are those, the more expensive ones, are they more sensitive in as far as husbandry goes? Like you were saying, the, obviously the Rodis and the Dendrobates for the most part are fairly, fairly hardy. Well, Do they get pretty sensitive at the top end? When I say sensitive, I should really say that more on the long lines of like tadpole and juvenile care. Oh, okay. So if you get a, and the thing about amphibians in, in general is Many of them are explosive breeders, like tree frogs are explosive breeders. Dar frogs, not so much. I mean, the average spawn or clutch, depending on what you want to call it, varies anywhere from maybe four or five eggs up to maybe 15, 20, which isn't a tremendous amount, but many of them produce these pretty consistently. I mean, you can get a, a pair of tinctorius that'll produce eggs maybe every four weeks or something like that. So there's a lot of eggs out there. The problem is like with these, it's challenging to get the obligates to to grow out. So if you're getting an obligate species like Ufaga pamilio, Ufaga histrionica, something like that, you're going to have, it's going to be more challenging to raise that froglet 
Whereas it would be easier with say an erratus or a tinctorius because you can supplement their diet. You know, you can make sure you can, there's more that you can do. So like I was just talking to someone last night about like now what a lot of the keepers are doing, we're adding clay that's been enhanced with, with minerals like calcium. So what you do is you add that into the vivarium and the froglets will go and they'll lay on, they'll kind of, well, not lay on it, but they'll sort of sit on it. And the theory is that they're absorbing some of the, some of the minerals like, you know, through this skin subcutaneously and they're metabolizing that somehow because a lot of these froglets don't, they just don't survive. You know, whatever is happening in captivity apparently is not enough, whether that's a function of what happens in the wild, just through natural selection. I, I don't really know. But that's what makes them challenging. I mean, when they're adults, it really isn't that much of a difference. It's just when they're babies. A lot of them are really, really small, and they need more TLC than I think the average keeper is ready to go for. Like with, with the obligates, um, the, the term we use is out of the water for the, the, age of a, the age of a frog. So the age of a frog is usually based on when it metamorphosed and came out of the water, when it ended its tadpole stage and entered, entered its, um, you know, its froglet stage. So most good breeders will hold on to their obligate species like Pamilio and Histrionica for two or three months longer than they would with their Tinctorius or Aratus or Phyllobates or things like that because the babies need that extra period of TLC. And sometimes they just they just fail to thrive. Same, But other species can have that too. So the care isn't really that different per se. I mean, you can kind of keep them all pretty much the same husbandry-wise. It's just that crucial period of development in the beginning. That's where most people get problems. And that's why some of the Ophaga species are more challenging to work with because it's very, very hard to get them started well. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. And it, it is funny the way that generates this sort of spectrum of species from, you know, the, it's obvious why an you know, Ophaga species would be more expensive than a Dendrobates <clears throat> and whatnot. But it, it, do, it does create this, like we were kind of saying, these throwaway species and and... I don't know if there's anything we can do about that. That's maybe just a nat- that's just the nature of having a a, a pet trade. You're going to have animals because even even on the reptile side, as species become more popular and more mainstream, people want to keep them less. You know, like the higher end keepers stop mm-hmm. wanting to keep the lower end species. It's like, yes. oh, I don't want to keep a leopard gecko because you can buy it from PetSmart or whatever. And it, it, I, I, don't, I don't even know. I think it's just kind of a a bit of a ruthless cycle in a way. It it is, and just to kind of add a little bit to what I just said about the Ophaga species, believe it or not, the Ophaga pamilio, actually, I don't think it's Ophaga pamilio more. I think it's Ophaga typographica or typographia, something like that. Um, it was the, I, I think it was like the type specimen for Ophaga pamilio. The, the, the locale na- name is blue jeans, which I think they come from Panama, but those are actually imported in re- really relatively large numbers. That's the obligate that you'll get very, very cheap because it's cheaper for people to import them than it is for people to actively breed them. So that is another, not throwaway species, but a throwaway locale is the blue jeans. And the blue jeans is a beautiful frog. It's bright red. It's got these blue rear legs. It's, it's a stunning frog, but it's easier for people to import them than it is to captive breed them. So in that regard, that becomes a, a throwaway species. Mm-hmm. And it, it happens. So, you know, you have to ask yourself, like, well, you know, where, why aren't people working with that? Again, it's, it's a money thing, you know? And the yeah. other thing is serious keepers don't really want to because you get lulled into that sense of security that they'll always be here because they're being imported in large numbers. And people have different attitudes about, importing and stuff like that. I mean, I can't speak for everybody in the community, but the general consensus now is that we really should be breeding everything in captivity. There's a lot of there's a lot of really good breeders in the United States who work with a lot of different species. And there are also other places outside the country that do work on a um on a local level like um uh Tesoros they have a uh, they own an area in Colombia where they raise dart frogs in in their you know in their location wherever that is and they export them legally to the United States so basically what they're doing is they're sort of they're circumventing the illegal trade by providing a legal trade of I don't want to say wild they're not really they're not wild caught I, I should say more like almost like farm raised mm-hmm. which really isn't which really isn't accurate either but um, and they you know the 
people here in the United States will generally kind of like share an import or something like that. They'll, you know, a big shipment will come in from Tesoros and a bunch of breeders will kind of divide it up, et cetera, either sell them off or incorporate them into their breeding program or whatever. But he's doing a great thing because what he's doing is he's eliminating the need to pull from the wild just haphazardly. You know what I mean? So he's able to export species uh, legally into the country that people want and people are willing to pay more money for because they, you know that you're getting a healthy frog that was taken care of properly and not just something that was pulled out of the wild. Well, and I think for dart frogs, it's even more risky to be pulling things out of the wild. I forget, was it you who was telling me or did I hear this off one of your podcasts or something that, you know, there are some localities of dart frogs that their patch of land that they are a locality in is like a tiny, like a football field almost yes. the size of, maybe it was yeah. you that was telling me that. Can you, so maybe we'll jump into localities and get, because that is sort of um, a mess of a, sort of a spider web. You know, you have these yeah. general species, but they're, they're so specific into certain ecological niches within their native habitat. See, this is another thing that I don't want to say bothers me about the, the reptile world, but the, 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 the reptile mindset about morphs and things like that does not, translate well into the dart frog world and i see a lot of by the way this light went off it's not a timer so if it's dark in here that's because the light went off yeah mine will go out soon too (laughs) yeah well there's no there are morphs of dart frogs but not in in the sense that you'd think um in wild populations is that there's a tremendous amount of variety in terms of coloration and size among members of the same species and that's a function of many things and it's all natural it just happens through just geography you could have a population of frogs that's divided from another population by a river and over how many hundreds of thousands of years they diverge and they, they develop new coloration and that population becomes genetically distinct. It breeds true. It's it's the same species, but it's it's got a very very unique set of coloration. I'm trying to think of a good I'm trying to think of a good example. I mean I, I don't really know I can't I couldn't pinpoint the location of a particular locale, but um, l- let's just say well we'll pick Pomilio we'll pick Ophago Pomilio. There is a lot of locales of Ophago Pomilio a lot and. Some of these frogs might only exist on a tiny little section of like barrier island, or they might exist in an area that's maybe the size of a football field. And what happens is that land will get developed. And, you know, we're not talking about hundreds of square miles or, or square kilometers. We might be talking about, you know, a couple of square miles. And then the, that locale is completely gone. It's been completely extirpated. But the thing is, since the species is, they don't protect Governments don't, they don't recognize individual locales right. per, per se as being protected. So as long as the species is, per, is protected, because technically Dendrobates tinctorius is, I, I believe it's like listed as least concerned by the IUCN because they're healthy, they're, they have healthy populations throughout Central and South America. Problem is a lot of those locales are teetering on the brink of, of, of extinction, I guess if you could call it that, because you'll have land development and agriculture and stuff like that. They'll come in. And they'll just completely destroy this area where this locale existed, and then it's gone. So it's not a function of human beings selectively breeding frogs to have a variety of colors. It's a function of nature having just radiated outward from whatever the original type species was or however long ago. So there's a tremendous variety, and we in the hobby like to keep that variety intact and as pristine as possible Mm -hmm. because... Again, we're we're not creating this. This is already created. We're trying to preserve it and not let it change. Whereas I feel like in the reptile hobby, people want to take something and and selectively breed it to change it to suit whatever is the, appealing to them. I mean, as far as morphs go, I have um, you know, I have only two morphs. I, I have two snakes here that are both, I guess, morphs, but they're they're albinos, which to me really is like the only morph. I, I don't really. Um, you know, I understand why people like that in the reptile community. I understand why they like, you know, different things. But, I mean, maybe I'm just a purist. Like, to me, the way it came out of the wild, to me, that's still pretty impressive. I mean, I have a wild-type bearded dragon that's sitting right next to me, and I think he's awesome. Because, you know, 35 years ago, when I was a little kid, sitting in my grandparents' basement looking at a, a book about natural history, I saw a bearded dragon. I thought to myself, I'll never own this animal. Never. 
and now I do, and he's perfect the way he is. I don't really see a need to change that, but I, I understand why people do. The problem with dart frogs is you don't want to muddy those bloodlines because it's, I mean, the exa- I was thinking about this before we, you know, before we started the show because I was looking at all questions. I guess the, the best analogy I could use would be like, imagine taking a bottle of a really fine wine, like a Don Perignon or something like that, and mixing it with like Colt 45. You know what I mean? Like they're both alcoholic beverages, but you've basically taken one really expensive high-end one that was, you know, and then one that's, you know, cheap and, and don't, don't, don't allow things to deviate too much from the way they were already created. That's, that's right. the beauty, that's the beauty in it. And I see people wanting to mix and match species. And again, that's another thing that's generally frowned upon because if we're going out of our way to preserve these specific lineages to maintain their purity, we don't want people coming in and buying a bunch of different species, different locales, and letting them mix and match and create hybrid offspring. So you generally don't do that. You know, that's 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 a big no-no in the hobby. Whereas other people outside in the reptile hobby tend to really selectively breed more for what they want as opposed to what actually exists, if that makes sense. If that makes sense, I guess. Yeah, they're going for a, a certain look that they want to generate rather than trying to maintain the look. Yeah. And it, it's, it's interesting because, like you said, it's those localities have been you know thousands of years or however many years of, of natural selection over time. And that specific phenotype works for that one locality. And so, so how, how different are some of these localities from each other? Like, like when you visually look at them, it's very evident that they're completely different i'll i'll give you i'll give you a few examples number one my my oyapak oyapak locale is almost like a dwarf tinctorius so he's about maybe about an inch an inch and a half long or so he's one of the smaller locales of dendrobates tinctorius so he's the same species as my patricia who is twice his size mm. and the um the matecho locale it's probably one of probably one of if i mean it's arguable but probably one of if not the biggest locales of tinctorius and that's a big frog that's probably about a two inch frog so you get size variation and you get color variation among the same species so the oyapak is this little almost like a cobalt or a navy blue with black and white outlines and the, the matecho is kind of got like a, like a black and a very very heavily yellow colored frog with um, black coloration usually along the sides and then around the face so that just gives you an idea of how different they are, but they can interbreed because they're the same species. I mean, even even different species can uh, can reproduce and hybridize. Like Oratus and Tinctorius can hybridize, and that's again, that's not something you want because if you have someone who casually is, you know, casually breeds them and then mixes up the lines and then sells them to whomever, that perpetuates a bad cycle that could perpetually, uh, excuse me, that could eventually. You know, it it could do some damage. It could muddy a lot of bloodlines that a lot of people have worked very, very hard to maintain. So, I mean, people kind of consider dark frog people as being a little bit snobbish, but the idea is that you're looking to protect something that doesn't need to be changed because it's so incredibly beautiful on its own. And an, another example, just to give you an idea of how crazy this is, if anybody out there has ever heard of the Ranatomea genus, Ranatomea is the genus that we also call them thumbnail frogs. They're by and large very, very small. They, they fit on the average person's thumbnail. They're about maybe half an inch long. They're, they're small. There's a, whole, there's a whole slew of species of, within that genus, but there's a species called imitator. And imitator mimics, um, they basically mimic the locales of other species that live in that area. Wow. So you have what do they call, what do they call that? Um, it's oh god, what is it? It starts with a B. It's it's a it's a form of mimicry, like you know how a a scarlet king snake is colored to look like a coral snake. Yes, I think yeah, it's yeah. Called, is it Batesian Batesian mimicry? I, I'm embarrassing myself because I can't recall it, but it's sort of like that. So what happens is you end up having something that looks. <laughs> They're not as the the conventional thinking is that their their toxins are not as significant as the members of the species that they mimic. Mm. 
So what they're able to do is they're able to put more of that energy into, instead of, meta, instead of sequestering and metabolizing those toxins from their diet, they're using that to reproduce and create more offspring. So it's an energy-saving wow. way for one species of dart frog to mimic another. And they, they, it's really crazy, actually, because the mimicry, it, it's, again, it can be, you could have two frogs in the same species on either side of the, on either side of a river mimicking two different species on either side of the river. That's how crazy it gets. So It's like frog that, inception over there. Yes, it's, it's like, I mean, I'm at a loss to describe how complicated it is. It's like trying to remember, it's like, it's it's like trying to explain how a soap opera started to someone today that in the soap opera story I mean no one listens to soap operas anymore but you get the idea <laughs> yeah. uh, well, like Netflix it's like trying to explain a Netflix series that started you know five years ago to someone who would never watched it before I could it could go on forever about it but yeah it's it's a very very complex set of um, set of species and species that imitate other species well that if there is that beauty of nature, and I think that's what dart frog keepers tend to want to preserve, like you're saying. So is that the general consensus for most dart frog keepers? Are most people happy to make sure things are being preserved? Or or is there a side of the hobby that people just don't care and they're just not purists and they're letting things go however they want? Well, there's, I mean, there's, there's sides to everything. And in the grand scheme of things, what I think is is my opinion i i have other people who i you know who i talk to that, that generally share my opinions i've you know in, in in the whole time in doing my show and i've had a lot of different guests on i've never had anyone really critical of others who take the hobby seriously it's really more people who don't take the hobby seriously and by that i mean people who go out and buy things on impulse or people who I guess, especially with 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 visual media like YouTube being a big platform now, a lot of reptile keepers, animal people, etc., they want to add dart frogs to their arsenal just for the sake of getting views. And yeah. that's not a reflection on people who create dart frog content on YouTube. I've seen people who have incredible channels, and I've seen people who are not even part of the dart frog community per se, but still have very good care. Care that surprised me when I saw it. What bothers me, though, is that you're encouraging people to go out and buy species as an impulse purchase, which I don't believe any species should be bought as an impulse purchase, but dart frogs are less tolerant to that. So someone who goes out and buys, I'm trying to think of a good, I'm trying to think of a good example here. Um, trying to think of, let's just, we'll, 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 we'll say ball pythons. You know, and it's funny because I remember when ball pythons were really difficult to keep back in the '90s. They were really hard, but yeah, um, it's easy for someone to go buy a ball python on impulse purchase, buy the you know the basic starter kit or whatever it is, and then the ball python doesn't get the proper care, but it doesn't die right away. Yeah, you follow, so it might live a few months, a few years. Who knows? I mean, I, over the years, I'd seen other people's animals and that were in a you know, really, really bad state. Even when I worked at a local shop, everything was imported in the 90s. We didn't have captive breeding the way we do today. And some of these animals came in looking awful. But the thing is, they might have been sitting in, uh, you know, they might have been sitting in a box for a month. Mm -hmm. Dark frogs you can't do that with. You, you can't neglect them. But the thing is, when you have species that are that cheap, oh, well, they died, oh, I'll just go out and get new ones at the next expo and try again. You know, I don't, I don't have that attitude. I, I, I don't care if my frog is a $30 frog. You know, I still want them to have the best care that they possibly can. I don't like to think of them as being disposable. But, I mean, look, you and I are on the same page with this. You understand that people are going to purchase animals on impulse. And to be honest, I'm, I'm guilty of it too. I've done it too. I've bought animals first and then thought about their care later. My mindset towards that has changed now, and I don't mm -hmm. do that anymore. But, you know, we've all been guilty about it. The, the, the problem is you want people, if you're going to come into the hobby, you're welcome to come into the hobby. The thing is... Don't try to reinvent the hobby. Take the advice of people who've been in it for a long time and people who have put a lot of time, a lot of money, and a lot of passion into developing an understanding in terms of how to keep these things. And that attitude changes, believe me, because there are things that we're working with now that we weren't working with a few years ago. So the standard of care does continue to increase in the dart frog community. But, I mean, maybe we're just kind of a different breed than other people I, I don't know I just 
if you're gonna if you're gonna keep dart frogs, keep dart frogs. Don't keep dart frogs because you want them as like a curiosity. Because that's what I see a lot of people doing. Like I'm, I'm not a reptile keeper. I'm not. I'm a dart frog keeper. Mm-hmm. You know. I mean, years ago, I used to think to myself that oh, I could keep anything. If I can keep anything, you know, herp in, in herp related in a in an aquarium, I can do anything. And the older I've gotten, I realized that I, 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 I that thinking is is flawed. You know. I mean, look, I, I know how to keep blood pythons and I know how to keep dart frogs and, and, and a couple other miscellaneous things that I, I don't know, some of them I don't even keep anymore. But um, that doesn't make me an expert on boas. I've never had a boa. I've yeah. never had a boa in my life. I, I have a basic idea of how to take care of them, but I don't know. I don't know. I don't know all the specifics. You know, there are people out there who have a lot of experience with boas who should. So if I want to know, I should talk to them first. I shouldn't assume that just because I have A, that makes me an expert on B. And that's how my attitude has changed. But a lot of dart frog people are like that. You know, I mean, a lot of dart frog people actually they they hate other animals. They hate reptiles. They I hate, yeah, I know. Yeah, yeah, they, they, yeah. I, I completely see that they they have a it's a very niche community. Yeah, and I, I think part of it is this mindset piece, and and even even um, Josh. What's Josh's last name from Josh's Frogs? I forget. It starts with a W, I think. I doesn't matter. Everybody knows Josh's Frogs. I, I told I, I I'm I'm drawing a complete blank. The other thing to know is there are like a dozen people in the in the dart frog hobby named Josh. <laughs> yeah, I know. It's, it's a common I think it's, name. What's there. his name? What's his name? Is it Josh Willard? Yeah, Willard. That's what yeah, it is. Yeah, 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 yeah. So so even there, his slogan with with Josh's frogs is connect with nature, and there's sort of this, this more of a pull towards replicating nature and maintaining those localities. So you're actually saying, okay, this locality is exactly what it looks like in the rainforest in this small section, and and for dark frog keepers, it seemingly is very important, and that goes all the way up into the care. I mean, you look at many dart frog enclosures are just beautiful i mean even behind you i can see the, all the plants and everything and and it's just part of that package and I, I i think what what i hear you saying is what i completely agree is you cannot take a dart frog as an impulse purchase like you need you you really ought to have the entire mindset package you want to have that wild replication and have a an eagerness to preserve clean lines and and have a piece of the rainforest in your room not just sort of grab what you want and make them look however you want by mixing bloodlines and seeing if you can produce your own morph by crossing two localities together it's just that's that doesn't jive with the dart frog community and yeah. rightly so if if you cross if you cross two locales of tinctorius you're going to get run out of town on a way <laughs> i i mean i'm going to be honest with you that's you know the the problem is when i see people the the mix and match thing really really bothers me and people who know me have seen me get like really like twisted over this but i've seen people on youtube they'll go to a store and they'll mix and match a whole bunch of locales and species and they'll throw them in one tank together and then you look at the comments and you see oh get this get that you know get a get a red and black get a blue and black get a, a red and yellow and it's like <laughs> this isn't it they're not a box of crayons you know it's not just i mean again obviously most of these people are making these comments just on impulses they're not even animal people probably but the point is it's not something that you're going to go into haphazardly and a lot of us in the dark frog community have really really obsessive tendencies we we, we like symmetry and um and balance and you know you you we're not gonna we there is no market for that i mean there's markets for new locales don't get me wrong you know, that's that's one thing that you do have in common with the reptile hobby is when a new morph comes out, obviously everybody wants it. When a new locale becomes available, oh yeah, everybody wants it. Mm-hmm. They're not gonna they're not gonna go out and try and cross it with anything to try and create something new. They want what's already there that hasn't been made available yet. So that does happen. It's not like, you know, I'm not trying to come off as being like high and mighty or anything like that. It's just that the approach is different. So you're not gonna be picking two different species, two different locales and trying to cross them to create something new that's going to sell, that's not going to sell. What's going to sell is something that came out of nature looking unique. Mm-hmm. That's what that's what's going to sell in the dark frog world and that's what people are going to want. The the highly coveted species are generally of course the ones that aren't easily available, the ones that are difficult to breed, the ones that aren't necessarily readable in in uh, excuse me, uh, available in this country. I mean in 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 Germany it's it's very very different and in the rest of Europe, especially continental Europe, they're like 
leaps and bounds away from us here in the United States, but they also have more species available to them due to just different legal reasons than we have here. But um, so, yeah, people will definitely hotly anticipate a new locale becoming available on the market, but only if it's, you know, a legit locale from an area that's never been had before. But if it's a morph or, you know, a crossbreed or hybrid like that, the frog isn't worth. I mean, it's obviously its life is worth something because it's a living thing, but no, it's it's not worth it. I've even heard of people, they'll voluntarily take, they'll voluntarily take someone's mismatched pair and give them a pair of the same locale in exchange to, to, to encourage them to get into the hobby. You know what wow. I mean? Like, like, okay, well, hey, someone goes on, I'm not on Facebook, but let's just say someone goes on Facebook and says, oh, uh, I, you know, I, my, my Aratus and my Azurius uh, had babies, hooray. And then I've, no, I'm serious. I've heard of people will contact that person and say, listen, um, send us those froglets. We'll give them a home where they won't breed. They won't anything like that. And in exchange, we're going to send you, um, you know, a, a, a male Azurius and a female Aratus or, you know, whatever it would be to complete two different pairs. Now you're on the right track. Now you know where to go. So that's kind of the attitude that wants to go forward um, rather than just trying to haphazardly create these like Frankenstein's monster type of things. But, you know, I, I could go on about that forever, but it's just uh, it's just one of those things that really, you know, miffs me is that the idea is you can just kind of keep these things i mean you don't get me wrong you can keep certain species communally you can um but mix and matching is 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 a bad idea and i even see people do it with other stuff and you know what people are probably going to get pissed and they're not going to like what i'm going to say but I, I don't understand what possesses people to keep dark frogs with mooring geckos there's a there's a picture out there online of a it was a morning gecko that was e- uh, eaten by a Phyllobates terribilis. It's got the thing <laughs> hanging out of its mouth. So I don't understand why people do that. Yeah, people like it. Well, hey, look, some people like like to light off fireworks. That doesn't necessarily mean that it's safe all the time. But yeah, exactly. Yeah. Well, it it just blows my mind the 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 dart frog community mindset and how, and how even like that story you're telling where people are willing to send frogs to people to, to just perpetuate the, the cleanness of the hobby. It's like they, you, the dart frog keepers really have a lot of passion and, and they want the hobby to stay stable and they're even willing to, you know, send frogs to people and make sure that that's not happening as much as possible. Like, it's pretty remarkable. Well, that was a rare exception. I don't want to make that out like it's the norm. That was yeah, a, yeah, that was a uh, rare yeah. exception. But Yeah, I assume that doesn't happen every single yeah. day, but even just the, even that mindset, like that mm-hmm. that is that seems like that mindset permeates through there, most dart frog keepers. There there is a lot of gatekeeping among serious keepers. There there is that, but look, you know, don't come don't come into any hobby or really anything in life guns blazing thinking that you know everything because at the end of the day you, you don't know anything look i don't i don't profess to be an expert at all you know i i appreciate learning things i got i learned things from people who were younger than me i learned things from people who have been keeping uh shorter than me but the thing is you have to res- you know you have to pay respect to the old guard you have to understand that there are a lot of people who really mastered the art of this and you know you, you're gonna have you're gonna have to get hazed a little bit you know, you're going to have to yeah. put up with that because it's the same. I mean, another good analogy is also the tarantula community. I mean, the tarantula community is like, you know, notoriously a little a little rough, but with good cause because you you don't want people to do things that are dumb and bad for the animals and bad for the hobby. So it's, it's the same thing, you know. Again, I don't know what other communities do. I'm assuming it's probably similar, but th- there is – you know, there's, there's tolerance for mistakes as long as you're willing to accept that it's a mistake and move forward. Mm-hmm. That, that's that's really it. You know, I mean, don't get me wrong. There, there are some hard asses out there who will really give you the business. And I, I'm not active on Facebook. I don't go into any of these groups or anything like that. And obviously people have different ideas and different opinions and stuff like that. But, um, you know, that can be a good thing. It, it, it can be, you know. And, um, you know, sometimes you have to realize that, you know, when you're starting out, you care is, is wrong, you know. So... 
It's just, yeah, that's just the way it goes. So if somebody is wanting to get into dart frogs, so instead of asking what is a good starter species, because that's sort of a, a bit of a trap as well, because then it takes us back into the garbage species where people just end up buying a, a frog because they want to get into frogs, but they, it, you know, it, it creates problems in itself. But if somebody wanted to get into dart frogs, what, what is the process do you think they should go through? Is it like, it, it, how, how should they choose a species? And then how, how do they step forward into that world at, with, with some success? Like you said, as you start off, you're going to be doing things wrong, but how would somebody get off on the right foot generally? It depends on the person. It depends okay. on the person's maturity level and the person's ability to, to make a commitment. Because at the end of the day, if you have the right qualities and the right characteristics, you can keep anything successfully. I mean, mm-hmm. you, if you had the, the, the time and the money and the know-how, you, you could keep a hippo successfully. But, yeah. I mean, obviously don't do that. But I think that it, it really depends on, like I said, the, the ability to, you know, understand that it's, it's, a, it's a commitment the way any other living thing is. And um, don't, don't be intimidated by the enclosures. I, that's one of the, the things that we in the dart frog hobby kind of do just to keep the hobby to ourselves as we kind of, we kind of make it a little bit out to be a little bit more difficult than it is. Um, the thing about enclosures for, for dart frogs is it, it really is very important because ultimately it makes care easier for the animal. You're, you're by having a planted vivarium, you are not just, it's not so much that you're creating an environment that's closer to what, to replicating to what the animal would experience in the wild you're creating a system that allows for humidity to be maintained in a better way, um, for waste to be processed. You know, obviously plants, they, they, they pull nitrogen out of the ground, you know, fungus, etc. And um, it just makes it easier because frogs, they crap a lot. And <laughs> not that many people realize that. And it's just easier to have that extra little boost. Um but you don't need to be that intimidated. I mean, you don't need to create this, you know, elaborate hardscape or this elaborate foam background. You don't have to do that. I mean, I have froglets growing out in, I, I have one uh, one froglet that's growing out in a little five-gallon aquarium with just some leaf litter and a mm-hmm. stick of pothos. So there's no shame in that. So you don't need to really get intimidated. It doesn't have to be anything. But the on the other end, though, is you can't really... You, 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 you can't just keep them on, you know, a roll of newspaper with a water dish the way you would what? other species. Yeah, yeah. So you have to do a lot of research. I, there are some really good books out there. I wish I had the title for one. I think it's the, I think it's the Complete Ufaga Pamilio. The book is actually written in German, but I was able to get the American, or not the American, excuse me, the English version of it on Amazon for I think about $40. That's a very, very good book. That explains... The basic care, the the you know vivarium setups, etc., things like that, and um, you want to be comfortable with culturing the types of feeders that these things need, or having a, red, red, a readily available access, uh, excuse me, a readily accessible um, feeders, because by and large, most dart frogs at some point in their life will only eat really, really tiny food, mm-hmm. and the the larger dart, the larger species like the phyllobates, mine will they'll, they'll take like half inch crickets. I mean, they would eat like you know. They would eat a bologna sandwich if I put it in there. That's how <laughs> rough they are. But some of the smaller species are a little bit more finicky. Not all of them, but so you're going to want to be comfortable with fruit flies. You're going to be want to. Um, you're going to want to have the ability to be able to culture them yourself or get them reasonably easily because that's really all. It's a it's a good staple diet for pretty much all the species. And. Um, you're also going to have to be able to master the husbandry. And I, I always tell people like, look, if you can master all those things, if you can master keeping the enclosure correctly, having the soil not rot, not keeping it too wet, because that's another thing people think is you have to keep these things super wet. Mm-hmm. High humidity and, and, and soaking wet substrate are two completely different things. So you don't need to keep them in this swampy enclosure. Like everyone, everyone wants to build a pallet. Oh, I'm going to build a paludarium. I'm going to build a paludarium. They don't live in, they don't, I have a couple actually, but um, by and large, leaf litter is generally the standard for for what you need. Yeah. So I would find find good information. Don't find like knee jerk information. Don't follow like people who are going at it for attention. Um, There are some really good channels where you can find a lot of info. Um, Troy's channel is, is a great start. 
Um, Troy's builds are more advanced than I think the average beginner would be comfortable with, but it's a great place to learn. Um, trying to think of who else has some has a good channel out there. Um, I mean, Troy's is, Troy's is probably the best. Mm -hmm. um, I'm actually it's funny because now I'm actually drawing a blank because he and I were talking about that the other day, and it's like there's not a lot of dart frog content out there on YouTube. That's yeah, there actually dedicated isn't really. Solely. No, there there really isn't, which is something that the hobby would also benefit from would be having more channels in terms of like proper husbandry and care because I feel like there's a lot of that with reptiles and there's a void there's a void for amphibians and that's another reason why I started the podcast but just to get I don't want to get too off track I want to get back onto your question but if I if I if someone asked me how do I get started I'd say all right well well what do you want to get out of it mm -hmm. well I want to keep colorful frogs okay that's cool so why don't we hold off on picking a species? Because again, anyone can keep any species if they understand the, the, the caveats to it. So I would have to say that maybe if you begin with, um, do some reading, find, find out how they live in the wild, find out some of the weather patterns of where they live. Um, also establish where you're going to keep yours because they're not tolerant of extremes. You're going to want to, like, I, I have central air in my house, and it was really hot up here, um, really all, the whole month of July, but it was, like, brutal for a couple of weeks. It was up in the high 90s. They'll die in that weather. They'll die in the high 90s. Uh, they can tolerate the low 80s to, like, within reason, and e even in the wild, you can find frogs basking in, like, 110-degree hot spots, but in the wild, they can leave. So you're going to want to have, a, you know, a, a room or a setup that's going to be able to handle that. So you... Ideally, you're going to want to keep the temperatures in the mid mid 70s is usually the safe zone. I mean, yeah, you could get up to 80 for an hour or so. And yeah, you could go down to like 65, 68 at night because, you know, jungle gets cold at night. People don't realize that. Some of those places can go down to the 40s. But you don't want to make those extremes consistent because ultimately that's bad for the animal. So uh, to answer your question, I guess I don't really, <laughs> I don't really know. <laughs> it's, it's a, it's very a hard long. question. Yeah, yeah, it, it, yeah. It's fine. You know, you know what? Look, let's make it simple. Find someone who knows more than you. Find someone who is uh, has a you know an, an established reputation in the hobby. And a lot of these people, a lot of these breeders are. You can ask them questions. You know, because a lot of them, a lot of people I do, they're not even so concerned about. You know, they're not concerned about like making a sale to make a few bucks off of a frog. They want to make you a customer for life. And by getting you into the hobby in the best way possible, that's a good way for them to develop a business relationship with you, which is good for both people. So you can reach out to a breeder, you know, reach out to someone and say, hey, listen, um, you know, what do I need to get started? And that person who keeps hundreds and th hundreds or even thousands of frogs in a collection for sale would probably be the best person to advise you in terms of what to start with based on your skill level. Uh, there are certain caveats. Um, like Tinctorius, I don't think that Tinctorius is a good beginner species. I don't. I think that there's too much temptation for the beginner to mix and match them. Plus, mm -hmm. that's also a lot of times how they're sold at pet shops. Um, I mean, I've seen a lot of pet shops where you go in there and it's like, it's just as a sort of dart frog, and it's like all different locales of Tinctorius. I'd go with a reputable breeder and I'd get a well-established froglet, even if you have to pay more. The, the older a froglet is, the hardier by and large most times it's going to be so don't get the cheap little runt get you know preferably something you could put eyes on at least for your at least for your first frog um generally for with the exception of ufaga you know three four months out of the water then you can tell the froglets are probably well developed um i mean if you can get a sub-adult that's good too the how long bread, do dart frogs live for generally Anywhere thirty years. Oh, okay. Oh, wow. So yeah, that's amazing. They can. That's the next thing I said about commitment. They live a long time, mm -hmm. so you can have. I mean, I have my my current oldest frog is. Uh, what did I say? Two thousand sixteen. So, she's six years old. Mm -hmm. But that's you know maybe half the frog's lifestyle. So they can live a long time. So you got to have the space. You got to have the the ambient conditions. You got to have an idea of how the husbandry goes and you got to have the feeders. So if you're not comfortable with fruit flies, you're not comfortable with um, uh, really, really small crickets and stuff like that, it's probably not the best uh, pet for you. But um, 
the ability to keep plants and understand lighting and understand humidity, that that does help. So it, you're going to have to also be kind of handy. There are some companies out now that make they, – they modified some of their existing lines to accommodate dart frogs. And I'm not – I've never had one of those enclosures, so I can't really comment on it. But like my exoterras, I have to modify those for dart frogs because there's too much ventilation. So, so you put something over top of the screen? Correct, yeah. So I, I'll cut – I mean I'm – fairly handy which i which is good because that's what i get paid to do but um you have to be able to you know you can you might need to, to modify the terrarium you might need to get glass cut restrict some of the ventilation um you're going to have to kind of understand how ambient humidity works you're going to want to be able to hand i mean hand misting works sometimes great sometimes it doesn't i mean my house with the central air yeah the frog's cool but it pulls all the moisture out of the air so mm-hmm. i'm missing them more frequently it's it's a balance you know um there's there's so many things that go into it. Like God, I, I could I feel I I feel like I'm completely dodging your question. But like the more I think about it, there's no, maybe I think maybe I'm overthinking it. You know, it's it's not as easy. It's not as difficult as people say. But maybe that's just the way I keep. Uh, I guess the best thing to do is like I said, get you know, master master taking care of fruit flies. Get a vivarium going beforehand before you introduce frogs to it, just so you understand how that it works. And understand the values of, of just good, you know, supplement the importance of supplementation, stuff like that. You know, it's a really good analogy is actually so if you can keep fish. Mm-hmm. If you can keep if you can keep a reef tank, like a saltwater fish tank, you you're gold if it comes to dart frogs. You know? If you are looking to keep amphibians, I would recommend a different species. I would recommend like a white tree frog. Mm-hmm. Or um uh, what's another what's another good beginner species? I don't really like to. Re- I don't really recommend Pac-Man frogs to people as 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 a beginner species. I, I say go with a white tree frog. You, you really can't kill those things. Yeah, um, and then work your way into something else. You know, I, I wouldn't. I wouldn't recommend to the average person start off with dot frogs right away. But it, it is possible. You know, for the right person. Yeah. Well, no, I think I think you gave laid out a whole bunch of great points there, and I think that analogy of the reef tank is actually a really good one because. You, you we do want people realizing that it's not just as simple as you know the the leopard gecko that you buy from like the, it, there is a little bit more complex there's it's not like you, it, like you said it's not like you can get into it and start with dart frogs somebody could do that but you do want to be going into it with the expectation that there's going to be some legwork there so so yeah that, that that was great why don't we wrap up the conversation chatting about your podcast because you, you had mentioned we'd mentioned at the beginning and you mentioned it just a couple of minutes ago and and maybe we'll, we'll wrap up with that tell me about amphibia cast first tell me why when did you start it and why did you start it okay i had again just to, just to back up to around 2016 i was recovering from some uh you know some some there was some some issues that going on and part of that was i couldn't sleep at night so what I ended up doing was I started listening to podcasts to fall asleep. And believe it or not, I, I didn't really listen to any Herp podcasts or anything like that. I listened to a lot of paranormal stuff. Mm. I, I listened when to... When you're trying all, to fall asleep, damn. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, I, I'm a big like paranormal person too. I, I, I like cryptids and stuff like that. I'm That help, that helped me fall asleep. And the more and more I listened, the more and more it just kind of became a comfortable thing for me. I'm, I'm, I'm not a very public person. And I felt like podcast is also kind of a great way to, to create some sort of content, but also have s- some anonymity mm-hmm. as opposed to something like, like YouTube or whatnot. But I started listening to podcasts and I got more and more into it. And then I thought to myself, you know what? I really like listening to these things. I have amphibians and there really isn't um, – there's no podcast that focuses specifically on amphibian content. There was a void there. So I thought to myself, look, this is right during COVID lockdown. And um, because here in New York in in early like 2020, it got bad, like real bad. And everything was shut down. I thought to myself, you know what? Like, this is your opportunity. Like, you know, how am I going to pass this time? Am I going to have something constructive to show for my time? Or am I just going to sit around and do nothing? So I started the show. And the idea was that I wanted to create a show that had a high level approach and I wanted to feature guests from, diff- from different disciplines, which aren't necessarily even hobby focused, and not even necessarily all, all dart frog focused. But that's kind of where the the majority of my audience is is, is in the dart frog world. And um, it start it started off fairly simply. I had a couple of people who were kind enough to be my first guests, so I should I should really mention by name. But um, 
Travis Stutchman from uh, TCS Dark Frogs. He was one of my first guests. A colleague of mine, Brianne Ross, she was one of my first guests. And uh, Alex Menke, uh, Troy Goldberg, uh, Bill Rodman from In Situ. A lot of these people were just, you know, I mean, who am I? I'm no special person. And I reached out to these people and they agreed to come on the show and they, they gave great interviews and that helped it go forward. And over time, it's it's continued to develop. People seem to appreciate the content. I don't I don't have a huge audience, but it, it is kind of a very specific topic here. So I don't necessarily expect that, but I'm, I'm happy with, with what I've achieved. I've released 51 episodes as of today. I've only take, I mean, I've, I've, I took one week off last month and I'm going to take another one off this month just for a break. But, you know, you know what I'm talking about. It gets tiring. Yeah. So th- that was it. I, I found that I had questions about things in the hobby, having been out of it for a while. And I found that this was a good way for me to get to know people in the hobby and to get people to come on and share their interests and their expertise with others, people who might be beginners who you know, wanted to listen or people who wanted to just talk shop. I've had scientists on. I've had conservation. I've had pretty much anybody you could possibly imagine who could contribute something to the discussion. And um, I've had a lot of really, really, really incredible people. I've had a lot of scientists. I've had a lot of researchers. I've had a lot of breeders. I've had a lot of um, people who just work with certain species. You know, I've had you on the show. Having you on the show was a real pleasure. You also influenced me because I was, <coughs> excuse me, I was listening to some of her podcasts as I as time went by, and I, I didn't really have anything in mind that I would listen to regularly because a lot of it wasn't really like guest focused, and that's for me that's kind of like interesting. And you had a lot of guests on your show, and you had a lot of the content that I found entertaining and, and interesting. So uh, I, I did model a lot of my approach based on your influence too. Mm. So you had a hand in that as well. And I, I thank you for that. Um, and it just sort of became something to do. It became a safe activity to do inside the house with, with COVID going on. And, um, you know, it just it was just sort of another way to branch out from the hobby, just something constructive to do with my time rather than just, uh, you know, just sit around and uh, and do nothing all day. Yeah, well, it's a fantastic show, and I, I can feel that professionalism that comes through on it, and it, the audio is good, and it sounds great, and yeah, you have some amazing guests, and and it, it is somewhat surprising that there was no amphibian podcast out there. Like, you filled the niche immediately. I, it, it's amazing that that void was there. There's a, quite a few reptile podcasts and sort of hurt podcasts out there, but to focus just on amphibians, there wasn't anything. It was It's kind of crazy. Yeah, and it's not exactly the easiest thing to maintain either because <laughs> yeah. there's, I mean, I do some shows on occasion. I, I call it thinking outside the glass box where I'll focus on another species that's not even remotely close to amphibians. Like I had, you had Nick Gordon on recently from the Ambrony yeah. Alliance, right? That's yeah. right, yeah. You had him yeah. on as well, yeah. I did, I did. Nick's Nick's a pretty amazing guy. His, his work is pretty incredible. Uh, I had him on the show. I, I had Richard from the Tarantula Collective come on. We talked about tarantulas. And um, I'm trying to think what was it? There was there might have been a couple more in there that you had I had Bill Strand on as well. I had Bill Strand on. That's right. Bill Strand was another person who influenced me too because uh, I, I listened. To, I'm not a chameleon person. I, I've kept chameleons in the past with very unsuccessfully, and I feel like if you you know just to, to answer what you had asked me before um, about someone beginning wanting to get into dart frogs, follow Bill Strand's approach to chameleons. Mm-hmm. Everything that Bill Strand recommends about don't don't do don't do chameleon care for dark frogs, obviously. But the, <laughs> what's going the way, on with my frogs? <laughs> yeah, sorry. Don't yeah don't don't do that. But um, Bill Strand's approach is very evidence fo- it's, it's evidence based, and it changes depending on what works and what doesn't. So, mm-hmm. Bill was another person who was extremely influential because I respected the way he approached the subject. Um, the, and the he's man so is, systematic. That's the other yes, thing. Is just like yes. he creates these really clear, simple to follow systems for people. Like, okay, I need this branch, this branch, basking spot, and it just yes. becomes very simple. He takes a very yeah. complicated thing down to something that anybody can follow. Yeah, Bill is extremely methodical in his ability to break down husbandry needs step by step. And you know, I I don't. Bill has been keeping chameleons for, God, I think like 40 years or something like that. I mean, I've been keeping frogs for a long time and I can make recommendations, but there are people whose jobs it is to work with them on the regular. So mm-hmm. I, I'll do solo episodes about certain species or certain care issues, but 
I, I wouldn't feel comfortable me doing that approach but i feel like if you want to know how to do it that's the approach that you would have to take would be something similar obviously you know don't chameleon care and darfrog care are not the same by anything but you want to use that methodical approach yeah do your listeners ever kind of get upset when you branch out beyond frogs do they go hey we want to listen to frogs we don't want to listen to about chameleons or are they do they find it interesting as well um it depends. I, I do communicate with some of the listeners and people like what they like. I, I don't expect everyone to like everything. I've never had anybody flat out get mad. I mean, I've had some people kind of like joke with me and razz with me. Like I had, um, I think when I did the, the Abronia Alliance show with Nick Gordon, somebody said to me like, but wait, it's an amphibian podcast. And I was like, ha, 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 ha. Yeah, I know, I know, yeah. I know. But you, you have to have, you have to vary the content because look, I keep other species, you know what I mean? And to talk about dwarf frogs every single day is it, it can get boring and it also can be challenging because there's a lot of great people out there, but not everybody wants to come on the show. And some people just, you know, it's not their thing. Some people don't listen to podcasts. So it's on the whole, I mean, the, the, my audience has been very, very good, very, very supportive Many of them I've actually become friends with because of the show, and um, I don't really get like I'll, I'll get constructive criticism, and I I appreciate that. I always ask people, you know, after I have a guest on the show for some, you know just if they have any constructive criticism, something that they like, something they don't. On the whole, everyone's been pretty happy with the way I do the process. So, um, you know, in, in the beginning, I did have people who were not in the dart frog community. Um, criticize me and you know there's a lot of people out there who have there have been more people who have supported me than criticized me so I mean again this is the type of medium where you're going to get people who are going to come out and they're going to be critical of what you say and what you do but the nice thing about the podcast is it's not passive content whereas you know if you're sitting on YouTube and you start scrolling and scrolling stuff's going to come up in your feed and you, ha- you don't really have to look for it. It just sort of comes to you. Same thing with Instagram. You know, you're scrolling through your feed. The, the pictures come to you. Whereas with a podcast, you have to actively search it out. So even though my audience is not huge, it's not like, I mean, look, I'm not Joe Rogan. But <laughs> there, there's there's a niche for it. And, and it's filled with people that I agree with, people that I like. And I'm totally into, into, into getting into discussions and debating people about things because that's, you know, that should happen. But um. You know the, the 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 criticism only helped me make a better show, yeah. And it only helped me realize that I'm 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 doing the right thing, and that I shouldn't be taking criticism from people who really don't know anything about what I'm talking about. You know yeah. what I mean? And look, if you don't like the show, that's fine. I understand that. I respect that. You don't have to listen to it. You know, yeah, I'm, listen to I'm, something else. And I, but that's it's honestly it really hasn't been a problem for me. You know, I I go out of my way to not let that be a problem. So, yeah, no, that's that's great, and there is a massive learning curve when you start doing a podcast. At least I found. I'm sure you found the same way. It's yeah, like you you think it sounds simple when you kind of have it on paper, and then you start going through the process, finding guests, and all this. And there is there is some some struggle. Do you do, are there any moments where where you you struggled? Were there any certain things that you found to, to be the most difficult with running the podcast? The most difficult thing is getting regular guests, mm, and yeah. I f- I found that. During COVID, it was easier because I had more. I mean, COVID is still going on. I shouldn't say during COVID because we're still we're still in the midst of it. But it was easier to find people with nothing better to do because there were more people with nothing to do. And the other thing was I had nothing to do. So now I'm not necessarily going to be as focused on pushing out an episode every week. Mm. I want to put out episodes when I have a good guest, and if that means skipping a week or so, then that's the way it's going to be. Because there's a lot of people out there that I'd love to have on the show. But the thing is, there's only so many people. You know what I mean? In the reptile community, if you're going to have a reptile podcast, like there's hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of people that you could get on the show very easily. There's not a tremendous amount of dark frog people out Mm -hmm. there or or amphibian people. And a lot of them have had on the show. I mean, you had a guest. I can't remember her name. It was the Hermit Crab episode. Mm Mm-hmm. Uh, I can't for the life remember her name, but she was a great guest. It had nothing to do with reptiles at yeah, all. Yeah, I love that episode. Yeah, yeah, it was that was that was one of the one of the more enjoyable episodes because 
it touched on a topic that most people don't normally see because you, again, you think about hermit crabs as being garbage species. Yeah. I have I I have long term hermit crabs that, you know, I, I took my 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 father in law. He 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 passed away from cancer uh, seven years ago, but. When he was alive with my mother-in-law, they would go to Atlantic City and they would come home with hermit crabs. And this, I'm like, damn it. I'm like, I told you not to do that. When we <laughs> bought them for the kids, I'm like, look, they're like, look, it lives in this. I'm like, it doesn't live in that little thing. I was like, damn it. I was like, now I got to go buy a big 40 breeder and I got to. So I set them up properly and I, you know, I never see them because now I have them set up the way they're supposed to be. But stuff like that, you, you have to branch out a little bit. And um, well, and you can learn so much from like that episode yeah. with, that was with Crab Central Station with Darcy and yes, and you. That's what I always say. Like, learn about other species, and that's kind of what you alluded to with the chameleons as well. With Bill Strand, is learn that, and you can easily translate it to what you keep. It's just different tactics, different methods of doing things, and mm-hmm. it all translates to animal husbandry. It does. It does. I mean, my moniker originally was do do what's right for your animals, not what's right for you. So if, mm-hmm. if, if you're compromising their care to suit your needs, it's not the best way. It's not the right way to do it. And a lot of times it's not even stuff that we do out of neglect or just to be jerks. We, we just don't get it. You know what I mean? We don't quite understand that maybe we're not doing something the right way. We get overconfident. We think that we know everything. And look, who am I? You know, I'm just some guy, you know, I, I, like to learn about things. I like to advance my knowledge base. And, you know, the, the podcast is a great way to do that because I get to speak to people who have more experience than I do. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, I have the I have the same sentiment with my podcast. I learned so much from talking with the people and it's it's great to be able to share that with an audience so they can kind of come along for the journey. Well, Dan, we covered a lot today. We've gone uh, deep into overtime here, and I know it's already <laughs> getting late on your side. So is there anything else that we didn't mention that you wanted to to mention before we wrap up, or do we kind of cover everything? I think we covered everything. It's it's one of those things where as a content creator, you can just keep talking and talking because it's very <laughs> exactly. rare that anyone asks you questions. I, I would like to thank you very sincerely for having me on the show. It's It's been a pleasure. I've been a fan of your show for a long time before I started my own show. It was nice having you on my show. I guess to, to wrap up, um, even outside of the, the realm of herps and dart frogs or whatever, you know, just, just enjoy what you do and do it well. Mm-hmm. You know, if you're, if you're enjoying what you're doing and you're doing it well, then that's the best thing you could possibly ask for. Um, and listen to my show. <laughs> there you go. I love that. Yeah, those are two great, some great tips there. Yeah. And I really appreciate being on your show as well. And I was happy to have you on here too. This is a, a absolute blast chatting with you. Can you yeah. let everybody know where they can find Instagram and the show as well? You can follow me on Instagram. That's the only social media platform that I'm active on. It's uh, You'd follow me at Amphibicast. That's um, A-M-P-H-I. Oh, God. <laughs> <laughs> A A M I'm I'm drawing a spelling blank. A M P H I B I C A S T like amphibia cast, not amphibia cast, amphibia cast. Um, you can follow me on Instagram, and that has a link to the Patreon page if you're interested in, in supporting the show. Um, I'm not a, I don't really push that, but um, I mean you're as a content creator, you know that there's you know there's there's hosting fees and stuff like that. The Patreon mm-hmm. page helps with it. And uh, you can find episodes of the podcast on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, pretty much any any podcast player. It's up on all platforms now. Even if you Google Amphibicast, it should be able to either direct it to the Buzzsprout, the hosting site, or any of the other platforms that have um, that have episodes listed. Which is really all of them. Even some you ever find stuff on your like your podcast that, like you didn't even know that you put it on. Oh yeah, all the time. I think yeah, those, those yeah. hosting places just push it out to all these things. People are like, oh, I listen to your podcast on this app. I'm like, I've never even heard of that app. I'm yeah, surprised yeah. it's there. Yeah, yeah it's I funny. Look, I look at like the the statistics and the um, the stuff like that for the dip, and I'm like, where did? I'm like, what is this? Like, how did it? <laughs> yeah, I don't know. But um, yeah, that's it. So if you're interested in dart frogs or other frogs, you know, give the show a listen, see if you like it, and I hope you do. And um, yeah, that's that's about it, really. I guess. Awesome. Well, I'll make sure all of that's in the show notes. People can go find the show and hopefully they go subscribe on iTunes or Spotify and whatnot. And and again, thank you, Dan. This was a, a great chat. I really enjoyed this. And we'll have to do another one on each of our shows at some point in the future. Yeah, it's been my pleasure. We could do one of those round tables that you're so fond of. Yeah, I love those. <laughs> all right. Thanks awesome. a lot, man. It's been a pleasure. 
All right, that is the end of that episode. Dan, thank you for spending the time with me. I enjoyed that conversation. And like I said at the end, we will definitely have to do another one on each of our podcasts at some point in the future. If you haven't listened to the episode that I recorded with Dan on his podcast, make sure you go check that out. But also go check out AmphibiCast. If you keep amphibians, you will find it incredibly valuable. And even if you, even if you don't keep amphibians, like I said in the podcast, sometimes listening to husbandry of other species you don't keep can actually help you keep your animals better as well. So definitely something to consider. Listeners, thank you for listening. I hope you enjoyed that episode. If you did, share it on Instagram or Facebook. That always really does help boost our numbers, and I do really appreciate that. If you are interested in interacting with the hobby on a deeper level, come join us at Patreon at patreon.com slash animals at home. If you are looking for more information on this episode, any links or anything that we mentioned in the episode, make sure you head to the show notes. That's animalsathomenetwork.com. Just click on the Animals at Home podcast header, and there you'll find the episode tile for this episode. Everything is there. If, if you want to click on any links, they're all there. And thank you very much to CustomReptileHabitats.com for sponsoring this episode of the podcast. If you're in need of any new reptile-related equipment, including enclosures, make sure you head to the show notes or the YouTube description for the affiliate, affiliate link. If you do make a purchase, a small commission comes back to me at no extra cost to you. And of course, that helps me support the show. I think that's it for this week, everyone. Thank you so much for listening, and I will catch you next Sunday.